um, building applications that use high performance communication. Uh, Don't worry about it. Keep talking. Okay. Yeah. My, my screen's doing strange things. Sorry to get interrupted there. Um, so it's a, a technology and there's, there's sort of three major characteristics that I think of as defining it. Um, first of all, we have a data path where uh, work is submitted and completions are reaped via asynchronous queues, possibly many queues. Um, so one, you know, one theme that probably will come up a lot is that this, you know, is kind of a standard technique and hardware design pattern nowadays. Um, but our, you know, RDMA certainly tries to take full advantage of that. Um, second aspect is that applications access this data path going directly to hardware without system calls or other things that are going to introduce overhead and, and jitter in between the application and the hardware. Um, and then finally is, you know, the, the possibility to do RDMA, uh, in other words, one-sided operations where one system, one, one half of the, of a communication partnership, uh, can access, uh, remote memory directly. Uh, so going to give a little more detail on each of those three things. So first one, um, asynchronous queues. Like I said, this is you know probably the way pretty much everything that connects to a CPU is designed nowadays, be it a NIC, an NVMe drive, even a GPU or any other accelerator. Um, but the... The data path in, in, in an RDMA system is, is driven by submitting work into work queues and then uh, allowing the hardware to pick that up and execute it uh, asynchronously from the application CPU. Uh, and then when the work is completed, then uh, the application is notified again through an asynchronous queue. Um, and so there's a, you know, a couple big advantages to doing this. Uh, first of all, you can overlap the communication and the hopefully useful work that your application CPUs are doing. Um, and then second of all, it, you know, it allows the kind of modern design paradigm of multi-threading, multi-core applications where however you want to split things up, with CPU affinity for cache affinity, affinity to, you know, you can submit work and get the completions on the same CPU or maybe on different CPUs or, you know, however makes sense to, to code an application efficiently. And typically RDMA hardware will support a relatively large number, um, you know, let's say at least into the hundreds or thousands of queues uh, that can be divvied up among different uses within an application. Okay, second piece, um, going directly to the hardware from the application usually falls under the generic term kernel bypass. Um, so there's a couple of, of things sort of more interesting than just, okay, we map some registers directly into the application and allow it to touch the hardware. Um, first of all, uh, RDMA kind of provides, uh, or is designed to, to provide an abstraction, even at that hardware level where, uh, the transport processing, because there's no kernel stack between the application and the hardware, uh, the transport processing is moved sort of across that interface into, um, the hardware side of things. So uh, application CPUs are not breaking messages up into packets, waiting for acts, those kinds of things. That's happening uh, within the RDMA device on the other side of, of the work queue. Uh, the other aspect of that abstraction is that um, 
the the hardware or the you know the RDMA stack is designed so that the data path operations are are going directly to hardware, but uh, things are exposed sort of in a safe subset so that a relatively unprivileged application uh, can access that subset of registers while the control path is still going through the kernel to um, maintain uh, you know, resource limits and, and things like that so that an application can only access its own memory and um, can only get you know, a subset of, of resources as limited by the kernel. So that's, you know, this, this idea of going directly from user space to the uh, hardware is, you know, pretty common in, in things like DPDK and uh, for storage SPDK nowadays, but uh, RDMA gives you a little bit more uh, safety and control than let's say mapping a whole NVMe drive into a user space process or something like that. Uh, I think I already kind of touched on the advantages. You know, I don't think it's, it's particularly secret now why you would want to do this. Um, you know, maximizes performance, minimizes jitter uh, and other bad things like that. Uh, Okay, and then finally, I you know I talked about uh, RDMA a little bit. Um, so that's what the, the name RDMA comes from is that we support one-sided operations. You can uh, submit a work request that says, "Please move this data to or from the local side to the memory on the remote host." Uh, and the CPU on the remote side is not involved. It's not even uh, notified in the sense that no code runs on the application CPU on the other side of a one-sided operation. Um, there, there's one key piece of this, which is uh, you know, both a, a safety security thing and then also an implement an important implementation detail which is that any memory that you're going to give remote access to needs to be pre-registered with the RDMA system uh, and typically that means uh, it's it's physically pinned so that you can always do DMA to it although um, some RDMA platforms do support on-demand paging through things like MMU notifiers and, um, you know, generally making the RDMA adapter uh, participate in memory management. But, uh, you know, the, the key property here is, is that there is uh, control of what memory is exposed to the network and it's, you know, it can be per communication pair and so on. Um, with that said, RDMA is not the, the only way to communicate over an RDMA network. There's also uh, two-sided operations, which is more like a, a typical sockets like uh, operation where one side allocates a buffer and says, you know, here's where I would like to receive an incoming message. The other side uh, submits a, a send work request that uh, does not specify what memory exactly it's going to go into. It just matches with a receive on the remote side. So it's it's like a typical send receive pair. Uh, and uh, those operations can be mixed and matched uh, on the same connection. I don't think I made it explicit, but in an, in an RDMA fabric, you can have multiple connections, just like you can have multiple sockets in a TCP network. Um, so, you know, things are demultiplexed by connections, but even within a single connection, you can send some data through two-sided send receive operations, and then maybe move bulk data through RDMA uh, operations that offload CPU on one side. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of the, the three 
defining characteristics of, of RDMA. Um, wanted to say a few words about how this is actually instantiated uh, in terms of protocols and, and networks and so on. So um, this is, you know, RDMA is, is a, a relatively high level set of technologies or ideas. Um, you can run I RDMA on different physical layers. There's both uh, InfiniBand, which was sort of the first widespread RDMA fabric. Uh, also uh, Ethernet, we all know what Ethernet is. Uh, and then I didn't write it out in the first bullet point, but there's you know other things like Intel's OmniPath is, is its own physical layer, although closely related to InfiniBand. Um, on top of that physical layer, and, and you know, let's say link layer that just moves packets around, you can have multiple different uh, transports, which I guess are like layer four, uh, you know, providing services like um, reliability. So, you know, an ACK, NAC protocol and, and things like that. And again, <laughs> there's multiple choices there. Um, Interestingly, there's a little bit of orthogonality in the sense that you can run the InfiniBand layer four over the InfiniBand layer two, or you can run it over ethernet when it gets called Rocky RDMA over converged ethernet. But you can really think of that as IB over ethernet in the same way that uh, fiber channel over ethernet was defined a long time ago. Uh, there's other choices on ethernet. You there's one from IETF called iWarp, which layers RDMA, usually on top of TCP. Uh, and then, like I alluded to, there, there's various um, proprietary networks that hook into the same software abstraction. So Intel's OmniPath is one. Uh, on AWS, there's this uh, EFA, which is sort of an RDMA network, although uh, doesn't provide all the service or all the uh, transports that others do. Um, and then again, on, on top of that, uh, there's a few choices like you can have uh, a reliable connection like TCP or an unreliable connection like UDP. Uh, usually reliable connections are, are connected, connection oriented. Uh, you have two peers that bind to each other and, and that connection just exchanges data between them, usually supports relatively large messages. You know, you might be able to send megabytes in one operation uh, versus unreliable, usually is a datagram uh, set of cues that, that just send um, one packet at a time. Uh, just wanted to allude to, to one thing quickly that in the Linux kernel for quite a while now, uh, there is this RxE driver, which is a completely software implementation of Rocky. So you can take any uh, network interface that you have on Linux, do RDMA link add, I forget the exact syntax, uh, but uh, create an RDMA device and, you know, if you want to experiment with RDMA without the hassle of actually getting hardware that supports RDMA. Okay, and I drew a picture like kind of to try to, to put into <laughs> pictorial uh, form the layering that I was describing before. Um, you know, basically an application goes through sort of a unified abstraction, but then there's a lot of choices of transports and physical layers that uh, can sit under that abstraction. And, and I haven't explained the word verbs quite yet. I'll, I'll get to that shortly, but um, yeah, just to, to give a flavor of, you know, like a lot of other networking technologies, there's a lot of choices of, of hardware and protocols and it sits under a unified interface from the application's point of view. Okay, so uh, 
finally, I guess we're almost 20 minutes in, finally get to the subject of the talk, um, RDMA programming on Linux. So uh, to start with... Uh, uh, Roland, you yeah. forgot to explain verbs. Um, well, that's the slide. It's on. Okay. Here. All right. Yeah. Um, so we're we're the the plan for this talk is to is to talk about sort of the relatively low level interface, sort of like going directly to sockets. There's quite a bit of I don't know middleware and abstractions that can sit on top of this, but um, this is you know talking about developing right to the the plumbing. So um, there is uh, a couple libraries that are the most important, lib IB verbs and lib RDMACM. They both live in the same uh, repository on GitHub. There's a link there. Uh, primarily uh, C, C++, and Python bindings provided. Uh, I think if you, you know if you go on, let's say crates.io, you can find Rust bindings and and so on. Um, but uh, you know the the libraries themselves are are C libraries, so that's you know maybe the most native interface. Um, so libRDMACM is. Uh, sort of semi-optional layer that handles establishing connections. Uh, the important thing about it is that it gives you an abstraction where you can always use uh, IP-based addressing. Uh, you don't have to worry about InfiniBan, local IDs, LIDs, or you know any other crazy stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, I, I think my guidance to anyone is to, to use libRDMACM to establish connections if at all possible. Uh, the other part now, so now we get to, to verbs and, you know, there's kind of a lot of <laughs> historical reasons like why are these two separate libraries? Um, because that's how it started. Um, and then why do we use this word verbs? So, um, you know, RDMA, I guess RDMA did exist before InfiniBan, like there were uh, VIA and, and other things like that. InfiniBan was was really the, um, you know, the, the first semi-mainstream uh, standards body. And so InfiniBan, the InfiniBan Trade Association, IBTA, defines the InfiniBan spec, um, which has a lot of uh, definition of the software interface to RDMA. Um, the interesting thing about the approach that IBTA took is that they did not give an API in the sense of, um, you know, here's a header file that you can compile against and these are the exact function calls that you need to make. What, um, what IBTA did is defined a set of objects uh, and a set of operations on those objects in, you know, human language with mostly enough precision that it's, you know, describing an API, but it, you know, like I said, is not a formal compilable API. And those operations are called verbs. Uh, verbs are action words. If, um, if you, you know, if you go to the, the dictionary definition of verb. So um, the verbs are like actions that you would take on RDMA objects. And the idea of libIB verbs is to take that abstract interface that IBTA defined and turn it into, uh, you know, actual API and implementation of that API. Um, now, you know, unsurprisingly over time, uh, as people actually use this API to, you know, to develop things against, we, we found that there's, you know, better ways to do things than the original IP, IBTA standard. Um, so I'll, I'll mention some of those and then there's, you know, work going on to, um, 
allow even more uh, sort of device specific optimizations. But um, so libib verb started with the IBTA verbs and and now has evolved a little bit beyond them. Let's say. Um, so this is you know kind of pictorially uh, what we're we're talking about here. Um, so you know there's a, a process which is the the little application that hopefully is the bulk of code being developed here. Um, memory regions. So as I mentioned before, uh, any of the memory that we're going to do RDMA operations on. Uh, needs to be pre-registered. So um, we, we need to, to get to refer to it uh, with the RDMA hardware. Um, but you know the idea of the, the stack, this is meant to show um, kernel bypass in a way and, and how the various pieces of the stack fit in. So libib verbs is the, you know, is a gray generic API that you can program to. Uh, there's a kernel side of that stack as well, a, a whole set of drivers on the kernel sides of things. Um, and then for any given instantiation of RDMA hardware, there's you know, obviously the hardware itself, but then there's some hardware specific driver code. And then you know, the, the slightly interesting piece is that in user space, there's a hardware specific provider that's you know, quite similar to, to other areas like uh, GPU drivers where there's you know, a fair amount of GPU specific code that lives in user space as well. Uh, and then, like we said with kernel bypass before, there are queues that go directly from user space down to the hardware. So CQ is meant to be a completion queue, SQ is a send queue and RQ is a, a receive queue. So, uh, you know, you, you queue different operations into those independent queues. And there, there can be many, it's not definitely not meant to, to say there's only one of each type of queue there. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I mentioned verbs and the objects that they operate on. Uh, wanted to touch on so we're getting closer to doing some real programming. Um, wanted to, to touch on the, the major objects that these verbs operate on. So first of all, one, one concept I didn't really uh, talk about before is this structure um, IBV PD. So that's a protection domain. And um, that is, is meant to, you know, I, I talked about the safety of um, user space only getting access to uh, a subset of resources. Uh, so user space, when when you start doing RDMA operations on a, you know, an RDMA stack, uh, you can create, you or you must create a protection domain as a container. Uh, protection domain will contain the work queues and memory regions. And a given work queue, the operations that are submitted into it, um, the RDMA stack will enforce that it can only access memory that is in memory regions from the same protection domain. So uh, that applies to both local operations, but probably more significantly to RDMA operations. So. Um, an incoming request uh, will only access, hopefully, memory that it's allowed to. Um, okay, next next important object, uh, this IBVQPEX. And um, I guess one thing I did here, uh, these are, like I, I mentioned before, there has been evolution of this stack, so there, there used to be just an IBV Q pair. Uh, now there's the EX variant of it. Um, this is the extended new style modern API. Um, typically will be more efficient and, and hopefully more convenient to, to program to. Um, one 
you know, kind of secret of RDMA programming is why do we always talk about Q pairs? Um, a Q pair just really is a pair of queues. It's a receive queue and a send queue. Um, and, you know, the reason why Q pair is such a, a fundamental idea is that, you know, typically communication flows in two directions between any two endpoints. So you have a, you know, a receive queue for receiving incoming messages and a send queue for sending data or doing RDMA operations. Um, but, you know, QP is, is kind of RDMA jargon. You can really just think of it as the two directions of a connection. Uh, again, like the, the other type of queue that's important is a completion queue. And again, this is a CQEX. Uh, each work queue, so an individual receive queue or send queue, uh, all of them are attached to a completion queue. You can kind of attach them however you want in the sense that, um, you know, each work queue can be attached to a different CQ or all of your work queues can be attached to the same CQ or however you want to divide things up. Like maybe all your send queues go into one send completion queue and all of your receive queues go into one receive completion queue or, you know, like I mentioned before, per uh, CPU or um, however you want to divide it up. Okay, and then finally, um, the the simplest uh, or the you know the most basic form of of memory registration that we have to do is IBV MR, uh, so that encapsulates some memory buffer, uh, you know, start address and length. When you register it, uh, you can decide whether or not you want to allow remote access to it uh, and whether you want to allow remote reads or remote writes or both or neither. Um, when you do a, a memory registration, you get some keys back. There's a local key that is used in local work requests. So if I'm submitting a receive to a receive queue, uh, I will need to provide the L key for the memory region that that receive is going into. Uh, if I'm going to allow RDMA operations, there's an R key. Um, I need to get that to the remote side somehow, you know, either through a, a send receive message or some other out of band mechanism. Uh, but the remote side will, will need to use the R key to refer to my memory. Okay, so uh, finally, you know, jumping into kind of a, a simple or the, the highlights, let's say, of a simple example where we're going to establish uh, an RC connection. Um, I guess before that, set up a memory region and, and the other things we need to do. And then how could we do a, a two sided operation on this data? Um, you know, to, to kind of keep things relatively manageable in time, given the amount of time that we have. Um, I'm just trying to hit the highlights here. Uh, there's a number of examples um, in that same source tree uh, that I mentioned before. There's directories named uh, examples uh, that that have working examples that you can um, investigate and, and actually run. Uh, okay, so um, kind of just jumping right into it finally. So I'm, uh, I guess, a half hour in and I got to some code. Um, it's not too bad. Uh, so the, the first step um, like I mentioned before, is creating a, a protection domain. Um, in, in theory, an application can create as many protection domains as it wants uh, to, 
you know, to partition up resources, maybe you want to isolate different remote uh, connection partners to make sure they don't step on each other or something like that. Um, I think by far the most common pattern, though, is you have one PD that you use for, for everything. Um, so uh, when you open up an, an RDMA device, you get this verbs context. Uh, next step is to allocate a PD, like I showed there. Um, if alloc PD fails, you know, probably that error handling is you print an error message and, and give up. There, you know, there's probably not much way to proceed if, if something that basic fails. Um, the, uh, the other thing that, that I'm showing before we get started is creating a completion queue. We'll, you know, we'll need that to attach our queue pairs to. Um, the, the highlights of, of what I need to provide to create a completion queue is, you know, of course I have to give a number of entries and, um, one of the, you know, the key things in, you know, I guess this style of, of queue oriented, uh, programming is, uh, it's really important to avoid overrunning queues. Uh, so there's, you know, some subtlety in, in thinking that's required there, but I, I need to make sure that uh, my CQ is sized so that, um, you know, if all of my outstanding work requests complete, then I have enough entries in my CQ to, to hold the completions. Um, and then the other uh, piece there, CQ context. So um, a typical you know pattern that you see in uh, the RDMA stack, and you know many is familiar for many other uh, places in Linux is I can supply my own context pointer, and when I get notified from the API about this completion queue, I'll be able to get that context pointer back and and tie the the CQ into whatever data structures uh, in the application that it's tied to. Um, so you know, once I've I filled in the attributes, I call IBV create CQ ex, and you know that's the the ex version of the API. I think uh, typically will. You know, we'll want to use the the modern, better versions of everything, wh whenever possible. Uh, and again, if that fails, it it'll return a null pointer, and there's probably not much I can do to recover at that point. Okay, so um, the other big piece of setup is. Um, and you know, in this case, I, I kind of have already given up on error handling, but um, I, I need to, to register some memory for communication. So, uh, you know, I can I, I get memory kind of however I want to uh, in user space. I'm I'm showing using malloc here, but. Um, It, you know, it, it's possible to allocate memory however you want to, and and um, you may need to use a different API, but it's even possible to expose uh, memory that's in a GPU or or other accelerator for RDMA. So you can use RDMA to to move data directly to uh, accelerator memory. That's you know, kind of a, a, a key use case these days. Um, but this is the the most uh, plainest old school uh, way of, of doing things. I, I allocate a mem some memory with malloc and I call uh, IBV reg MR, IBV register memory region. Like I mentioned before, a memory region is always attached to a protection domain. So I have to give that protection domain pointer that, um, I created before, and then I pass in the 
pointer and the size of the pointer. And then there's a flag. Um, like I mentioned before, I can, you know, optionally expose this memory for remote access. In this case, uh, I'm just saying that uh, the local RDMA adapter is going to be allowed to write into this memory. I do need to give that local write permission if I'm going to use uh, the memory for receive requests. Uh, if I don't do that, then uh, any receive request that targets the buffer will will fail uh, with a memory protection error. Uh, I could also, or in IBV access, let's say remote write, and then uh, I would get a memory region with an R key that I could send to the other side, and the other side could target it with a RDMA write. <clears throat> okay, so now um, jump into using libRDMACM for uh, connection establishment. Like I said, it, it's um, not strictly required in all cases, but uh, provides a good kind of sockets-like abstraction of connecting on, you know, it, it makes it feel like you're, you're, creating a IP socket with the, the remote peer, although uh, it is a little more asynchronous than uh, standard socket programming. So um, first of all, that and uh, sorry, I should have said, um, just like with sockets, there's an active side and a passive side for a connection. So, um, you know, one side sort of serve is a server and the other side is a client and um, does mean that the application needs to decide who's, you know, of the, the set of peers that are communicating, you need some way to decide which is gonna be the active and which is gonna be the passive side. Um, you know, hopefully that's a, a relatively solved problem because it's the same thing that happens with sockets for the past, I don't know <laughs> how long it's been since Berkeley sockets. Um, anyway, uh, applying to, to both sides um, to support the sort of asynchronous style, uh, we need to create this object an event channel. So that is a way of, uh, picking up future events. Um, again, this is this is something <laughs> where uh, you ask for it and, and hopefully you get it. Um, otherwise, there's not much your application can do other than hopefully exit gracefully. Okay, and again, um, we need to, to figure out the um, the address of the server side. Uh, both sides need to do that because the server side is gonna bind and the passive, or I'm sorry, the active side is gonna connect. Um, so uh, the function, the, the key function here is RDMA get adder info. Um, again, very analogous to just the, the plain old C library get adder info. Uh, except uh, takes into account that it, it needs to look up RDMA devices and so on. Um, okay, so now let, let's look at the, the listening side. Uh, I already mentioned event channels. The, the next key object that libRDMACM exposes is this notion of an RDMACM ID. Uh, an ID really is, is sort of like, um, I don't know, a, a socket handle or something like that. It, it um, represents either a connection or a, a listening queue. Um, so to listen, we need to create a CMID. Uh, we need to pass in um, the event channel that we created before, that's where events for that, you know, for connection requests will be delivered. Um, again, there's a, 
a my context where you can get back your context when events happen. Um, and then RDMA PS, PS stands for port space. Um, the, the RDMA CM, like I said, provides a, uh, you know, IP like addressing or IP addressing. It, it is not using, um, you know, it's not competing with the, the normal network stack, but uh, has its own set of uh, ports. Typically for uh, reliable connections, which is what we're making here, we'll just say RDMA port space TCP. Uh, there's a few other choices there. Probably not, <laughs> don't have time to, to get into that. So I'll, I'll just say um, we'll do TCP because it, not that we're necessarily establishing a TCP connection, but we're establishing a connection that's reliable, connected like TCP. Um, we bind locally to that address and then call RDMA listen, which just says notify me if any connection requests show up. And so at that point, um, we're kind of into asynchronous mode. We're waiting for the active side of the connection. Okay, so now let's look at the active side. Again, um, we need to create a CMID, like I mentioned before. And again, it's gonna be in the reliable connected port space. Um, One, one thing worth pointing out here is we, we need to resolve the remote address um, that might be doing something like ARP or something else involving network traffic to uh, InfiniBand uh, subnet manager or something like that. So uh, that resolve address call is asynchronous. So uh, we need to wait for an event at that point once we've kicked off the resolve okay. process. Um, of course, we can issue multiple of those in parallel. Um, that's the whole point of asynchrony, but uh, it, it's typically not a, a synchronous operation. So move on to how do we pick up events? Um, not super profound, but uh, there's a RDMA CM event pointer, uh, just call RDMA get CM event. That usually will be a blocking call. Um, under the covers, it's it's reading from a file descriptor and you can um, get access to that file descriptor to do, you know, poll, e-poll, whatever um, file descriptor multiplexing you wanna do to wait for events. Um, but in any case, once you've, you've read an event, um, the event has a type and you can dispatch based on that type uh, for space reasons. I just showed the, the one that we were waiting on on the previous slide, which is telling us that address resolution succeeded. Um, talk a little bit more about that, but um, did want to point out uh, basically RDMA get CM event is allocating some stuff internally and then uh, when we're done processing the event, we call ACK CM event on it to, to free up any resources that got allocated. So um, if you don't do that, eventually you'll leak enough stuff that probably something bad will happen. Okay, so- um, Roland, I was going to, yeah, before you dive into deep, yeah. The question was, should we, uh, any questions? I mean, anything that is clear because we've talked about all the objects for the most part is going to now go into a program. So if there are things that you are, you would like explain more, now would be a good time to ask. If there are no questions, we'll continue, of course. <laughs> all right, we're going ahead. Okay, how many people are awake in the room? Um, That's a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean definitely um hopefully i was trying to, to leave a little space for people to interrupt but yeah please definitely interrupt it at any time um so i didn't i didn't want to give too many details uh just because you know i can see we're already getting up on <laughs> 50 minutes uh 
and I have a few more slides, but um, this kind of gives an idea of the flow of using uh, libRDMACM. So like I mentioned, we, you know, we, on the active side, we kick off the address resolution. Once that succeeds, we'll call RDMA resolve route, which is another asynchronous operation. Uh, when that completes, uh, at that point, there's a, a lib RDMA CM wrapper around creating a Q pair, which we need for the, the um, connection. And then we'll call RDMA connect, which is you know very much like finally we're getting to connect in the sockets world. Uh, when we call RDMA connect, the server side, the passive side, we'll see that event connect request. Uh, at that point, the passive side will call RDMA accept. Uh, and um, once that happens, both sides call RDMA CM, or not call, both sides will receive RDMA CM event established that tells them that the connection is established and they can go off and, and do the actual useful data movement that they were establishing the connection to do. Um, a few errors, this is not an exhaustive list, but um, you could get uh, unreachable, so, you know, which basically says um, that address that you asked me to figure out where it is, I can't find it. Um, or rejected, that's you know, if the active side sends a connection request, but the passive side hasn't listened for connection requests, you'll likely get a reject, sort of like getting a, a TCP reset in the sockets world. Um, and then in you know normal operation, when you're done and you tear down the connection, then the peer will get a, actually there's a disconnect request event, but um, when things are finally torn down, you get that disconnected event. And at that point, you know, hopefully you'll want to gracefully handle the fact that you no longer have that connection and, and maybe free some resources or um, otherwise, you know, continue shutting down or, or whatever is going on. Okay, so that is a probably much too fast introduction to lib RDMA CM. Um, like I said, there's some examples there. Um, so now just very quickly, uh, probably too quickly, um, go through kind of the actual <clears throat> data path. So let's assume that we we have a Q pair that was set up probably with libRDMA CM. Uh, actually, assuming it's a, a QPEX for the next case, um, there is not a, uh, there's not multiple receive APIs. Um, so that this is kind of the, the one way to do it if you want to um, post a receive work request, which is again to, you know, like I said before, this is one side of the connection saying, uh, I'm ready for an incoming message. Um, and when it arrives, I would like my local RDMA stack to, to deliver the data into this buffer. Um, so the, the key structures here is there's a receive work request structure. Uh, and then um, receives can actually have a, a scatter list. So you can um, place the data into potentially discontiguous set of buffers if you want to. In this example, I just show it going into that one single buffer that we allocated before. Um, so, you know, filling in the work requests, it, it has a pointer to the scatter gather list or the scatter list for a receive. Um, in my case, like I said, there's, there's one SGE scatter gather entry. Uh, so the list length is one. Uh, again, the, the pattern that I mentioned before, there's a WRID work request ID. Uh, that's an opaque 64 bit quantity that when this work request is executed and a completion queue entry is generated for it, that work request ID will be copied into the completion queue entry. And so I can use that to, to correlate back to 
uh, whatever context I need to understand um, what uh, work request this this was. Um, it's sixty four bits, so you could you know you could cast a pointer into a sixty four bit integer, or it can be an index into an array, or however you want to use that work request ID. Um, yeah, and then filling in the the scatter list, uh, pretty simple. There's an address, a length, and then uh, the important thing is I need to tie it to a memory region. So I need to fill in that L key uh, member of the SGE as well. Uh, that gives the, the RDMA stack, uh, the RDMA, when it's trying to, you know, when a, a message comes in that is getting delivered to this receive buffer, it's going to use that L key to look up the memory region and, and make sure that it has permission to, to write at that address and length and actually um, tell it how to translate that address into a, a physical memory to DMA into. Um, okay, finally, once I've, I've filled in all the information I need for that work request, I just call IBV post receive. Uh, that takes the QPair pointer, um, should have been ampersand WR. I need to pass in the address of the WR. Uh, sorry about that typo. And then uh, the bad work request is just if um, I pass in, so I can pass in a list of work requests. Uh, and then if there's a malformed one somewhere in that list, IVV post receive will re return an error and it'll fill in the pointer to the bad work request. But hopefully we don't have a buggy program and, and IBV post receive works. Okay, so once I've done that on one side of the connection, um, the other side of the connection can now send data. Um, and that data will get placed into the, um, the buffer that I, I just posted. Um, this is using the um, modern interface for, for posting sends. So uh, it's a, a little bit different in style, but um, basically what we do is um, call IBV work request start on the QPair. Uh, that that tells the stack, okay, I'm going to start filling in a work request. Um, and I set the work request ID flags. Um, and um, did I, <laughs> I think I left out IBV WR send here also when I was right. adding this in. Um, so I need to tell the stack that it's a send work request. So I call IBV WR send, um, but uh, and I, I set the gather list entry where it's going to um, get the data from. Again, on a send, I can have a discontiguous set of buffers. I would call set SGE list in that case if there's multiple buffers to submit, um, and then finally call. Um, IBV WR complete to say, okay, I'm done filling in that send queue entry and please start executing it. Um, I guess one thing I, I left off talking about on the previous slide is when I call IBV WR receive, uh, that tells the RDMA stack that there's a buffer ready for um, incoming messages, but that buffer, that work request is just just going to sit there until a matching incoming message comes in from the network. Uh, it could, you know, it could be pending for, you know, microseconds or hours or however long. Uh, sends are a little different in, in this case. Um, you know, of course, it, it, execution is not instant, but that IBV WR complete is going to tell the RDMA stack, please 
send this as soon as you can get around to it. Um, so execution, you know, should start relatively instantly. And that's going to push something out into the network and, and consume the request that I just uh, posted in the previous slide. Um, and when that happens, you know, hopefully everything is good in the network. Uh, the message gets through, the acknowledgement gets back. Uh, both sides will say, okay, that work request you just submitted is completed. And so now finally, the, the last piece I wanted to go over was how do we uh, collect the, the completion notification for that. So that's you know called polling the CQ. Uh, it is non-blocking. I can you know I can have a, a while true loop that just does this uh, in a in a tight loop uh, looking for the, the next completion. Uh, and yeah, again, this is the, the modern CQX, CQEX version of the API. So um, I fill in this poll CQ attribute structure. I don't think there are any options yet um, and call start poll. Uh, in this case, uh, it, it's definitely not you know, like before, you know, I said, if, if I get an error back, there's not much I can do. In this case, I probably usually will get an error, uh, eno ent, which says that the CQ is empty. Uh, and, and that's, of course, totally benign. It just says, you know, since the last time I checked, no new completions were delivered. Uh, if there are completions available, then it will return zero. Um, and I can look at uh, the status of the work request in CQ status. Uh, I get back, you know, this is a, an example of that pattern that I've, I've said a lot about already that CQ WR ID will be the work request ID of um, that I passed in when I submitted the work request to the receive queue or the send queue. Um, there's other fields like for receive, how many bytes were in the message that I received uh, and, and all the information that you might wanna know about a completed work request. And so I can consume that. Um, my work request is done. I can free up uh, local resources, go on to the next step of my state machine, uh, deal with the data that I received if it was data coming in um, maybe send more data if it was a send that completed, you know, whatever the next step is, I can kick it off there. Uh, when I'm done, I call IBV next poll. And again, that will return zero if there's another completion queue entry available or it'll return eno entries if, if I've now drained the CQ completely. And um, if I consumed any, completions, I need to call end poll to signal that this batch of polling is done to the, to the rest of the stack. Okay, and so those are kind of the, the highlights of an application. Um, see, I'm already a little over time. I did wanna just quickly say a few of the differences with um, unreliable datagram applications. So in that case, it's it's not a one-to-one -one connection between, you know, one system and a, a communication peer. Uh, a UD queue pair can receive datagrams from multiple different network partners, uh, including usually multicast. So you can send one message that the switch Fabric will replicate to multiple destinations. Um, the the message size is is restricted to one packet, so you need to know what the path MTU is in your fabric. Um, any reliability needs to be done at the application layer. It, it's not like 
with RC where um, multi-packet messages and acts and retries and so on are, are hidden below the RDMA interface. If you want to use do something reliable on top of UD, then you need to make it reliable within your application. Um, there's a notion of a, a Q key that um, a, a peer can only send a datagram to your UD queue if it knows the Q key. Uh, and then along with the other completion information, you do get, you do find out where the message came from when a, a UD message is delivered. Um, since you, you know, since potentially multiple peers can be sending messages to the same queue. Okay, so <laughs> I, uh, I got through all of the slides that I presented. Um, we're a little over time. I guess it's, it's getting later in the day there. Um, but yeah, I'm happy, you know, so <laughs> it's been a very quiet audience. I'm, I'm happy to, to answer any questions that anyone has at this point. Yeah. I, I was actually wondering if Jason wanted to add any words. Yeah, or... and I guess I... I... Oh, yeah, I, I, I can say a few a few things, too. Um, I think what Roland just presented is um, what, what I considered mine was like the verbs interface. To J J Jason, hang on for one second. Your audio is coming very low. Very There's low. There's nothing we can do. Okay. Um, is there any way you can... Is Do you have volume control of some, any kind? Uh, it's set to maximum. Much better. Is this better? That's better now, actually. Okay. I, I, will, I will speak more loudly. Um, so the verbs interface is is one of the many kind of higher level interfaces to access the, the RDMA stack. Um, there are many choices. And, and at this moment in history, a lot of applications choose not to use verbs if they want to access the, the kind of functionality that's, that's under here. Uh, for instance, if your application is, is quite concerned about things like raw Ethernet, then you're probably going to choose DPDK as your high-level interface. Uh, if, you're, if you're in an HPC kind of environment, you, you might use UCX or an MPI. Uh, if you're doing GPU workloads, you're probably going to reach for something like UCC or, or, or Nickel. And we've seen kind of the, the industry consolidate around these higher-level APIs that are, that are tailored for, for certain applications. So... If, if you're coming to this uh, tutorial looking like, how am I going to consume RDMA? Uh, verbs is a, is a choice. Uh, it, it gives a certain level of functionality, but there are other choices too that may be more optimized for the domain that, that you're interested in working in. Um, this, this helps you understand the standards and the technology and the, and the low level interface, but there, there's a lot going on now um, uh, in terms of like differences in the ecosystem. Um, but otherwise I thought it was a, a, a great presentation. It really, really covered all the details of, you know, how to get, how to get through the, the, the first objects. Um, if anybody else has any, any questions in the audience or comments. Um, there is a question on the, on the chat. Uh, is there an equivalent of RSS to distribute reception over multiple CPUs? So yes, there is. Um, there, there's an RSS implementation. There's, there's a couple actually, uh, and, and different hardware have kind of different choices there. One of the um, curious things about the way the RDMA stack is structured is that every single feature that exists in like an Ethernet driver can also be accessed through the RDMA stack in an environment like DPDK. So when I, when I talk about like application specific um, middlewares, DPDK running on top of RDMA will do all the RSS things. It will do them at the same capability as like the, the kernel drivers are able to do them. And DPDK gives you a nice easy to use API for that. Um, this starts to run into an area that's like um, very hardware specific, of course, because the, the way that, that hardware implements RSS tends to vary a little bit. Uh, and in the, what I would call the common verbs, like the IBTA specified verbs, we don't, we don't have a standardized RSS. There's been a lack of interest um, in doing that. Question in the audience. We, uh, 
Thanks. Thanks, both of y'all. This is a great presentation. Uh, you guys talked about the data path. Uh, on the control path, you know, there are a uh, lot of things under the hood around congestion. And uh, maybe if you can touch upon, uh, you know, interoperability is one of the key things. Uh, and how does, uh, how, how is that abstracted out? And if there are any newer developments in this area? Um, so I assume you're talking about kind of rocky interoperability. Uh, That's and you correct. Mentioned yeah. Congestion management, and that's one of the, um, I guess, interesting points from an interoperability perspective. So, uh, like, when you look at the network protocol, the packets on the wire are all nicely standardized, but the the various vendors have innovated in in how they do congestion management, how they respond to drops, how they deal with um, like ECN notifications, maybe QCN or some of these other technologies. And right now, I would say there hasn't been a lot of standards activity to support, um, like what should be the you know what what should be a standards based uh, interoperable conjunction management scheme in something like Rocky. Uh, you know, it's not to say that the vendors don't interoperate, but if you if you run them on congested networks, you may not get the peak performance as you as you would get if you if you used like a single vendor's, um, you know nicks and switches where they they do the congestion management in a, in a way that the the congestion control algorithms are are comfortable with um i know we've seen some 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 research activity in terms of like programmable congestion management and we may see some um some relief to kind of the, the lack of standardization through that where um, a network environment like maybe a hyperscale or something um could define their own congestion management that suits the network topology that they're operating. And then the, the devices could then implement it in, in sort of a programmable fashion. But that's that's still a bit of a research, um, I think early, early, early days on that. Yeah. Could we get them? <coughs> Uh, thank you for the talk. I have a question regarding uh, NFS. Uh, this uh, in kernel RPC of uh, uh, ADMA, and I'm wondering well, what it is. Like, I understand that this may be a huge topic, but in short, this is uh, just a different stack. Like, we have NFS, uh, XDR RPC on top of TCP, or we have um, RPC over ADMA. Or the whole stack is completely different. Like there is also different some differences on XDR, on RPC, on NFS uh, SF layer. Like uh, how, how the things work on on the side of NFS. If okay, it, so like it make makes sense. Yeah, I think I think you know maybe maybe it's worth sort of touching on a, a bit of the broader a broader picture here. Um, so you know this RDMA activity is. I don't know what we say, like 20 years old at this point. And basically every every protocol that's ever been used in a, in a serious high performance kind of way has, has undergone an optimization for RDMA. Uh, and, and an optimization for RDMA means that when the protocol is deployed in RDMA, it uses less CPU power and you get more network performance than, than you would out of kind of the non-optimized version. So um, pretty much everything that you can think of has, has gone through this, you know, we have uh, iSCSI optimized for RDMA, we have uh, SCSI optimized for RDMA, NVMe optimized for RDMA, NFS optimized for RDMA, SMB optimized for RDMA, and, you know, onwards and onwards. So um, it's not surprising that there is an NFS optimized for RDMA. Um, when you ask specifically about the RPC layer, that that's how they chose to standardize the optimization of NFS. They, they decided to define um, a, a different RPC transport that was optimized for RDMA. Um, so it can do things like zero copy your, your block data when you do an NFS RPC. And then they layered it in the software stack so that the, the higher level pieces of NFS that deal with the file system and the caching continue to use the same RPC methodology and the same RPC protocol, but under the covers, it's substituted with an RDMA optimized flavor of of NFS RPC. So that's when you look in the kernel, that's what you're seeing. When you look in the the RPC directory, like XRP, what is it, XRPC or something like that, 
um, that, that Chuck Lieber works on a lot. It's does does that help understand the the purpose? Yeah, kind of. Okay. Yeah. So just um, I think that's a, a good way of of thinking about it. Um, like very specific to NFS, the the protocol definition, as I understand it, is um, like like you noticed there was a definition of uh, an RPC layer that runs over RDMA and um, the higher levels of NFS consume that RPC layer, and then certain types of data is um, defined to be direct data placement eligible. And, um, you know, so that's sort of a collaboration between the higher levels of NFS and then the specific transport. If you're running NFS over TCP or NFS over UDP, those RPC layers don't know about direct data placement. So it, you know, it sort of falls back to the, the normal way of doing things or the old way of doing things. If you're running over RDMA, then uh, when you're transferring file data, let's say, you know, you, you performed a read operation, sent that RPC, uh, the response to it is going to carry some payload. The higher levels of the stack are going to say this can be, um, you know, directly placed into the buffer where the file data is supposed to go, and the NFS or I'm sorry, the RPC over RDMA layer, you know, says okay, I know how to place data directly using the one-sided operations that I was talking about, and and so you'll avoid um, a copy from receiving the data over the network into the file buffer. Okay, okay, so it sounds like uh, this uh, control plane, which uh, maybe uh, remains more or less the same as for TCP or UDP, but the data plane uh, should be much more optimized for DMA because it's completely different for moving buffers between the machines, right? That That's right. Um, and, you know, maybe I didn't say enough about it, but the like the, the big advantage of RDMA and, and one-sided operations is that um, you can, you know, the the network can put the data where it's supposed to go in the end um, in a more conventional, let's say, TCP stack, right? Like a, a packet is received, the network stack has to figure out which TCP socket it, it goes to and, you know, deliver it into memory and then when the RPC layer consumes it, it's going to copy it into the the final buffer. Um, and using RDMA allows a sort of a zero copy receive path where the RDMA adapter delivers the, um, the data into the buffer where it's finally supposed to end up, which, you know, is a pretty significant savings not just in cpu overhead but in in memory bandwidth which is you know another quite scarce resource like uh you you write the data into memory once instead of writing it into memory reading it into the cpu and writing it back into a different section of memory okay thank you very much any last yeah Do you recommend or does, does it exist any tool to measure the performance for the RDMA driver using the libraries that you commented? Yeah, there are several tools that are um, published in the Linux RDMA and, and various custom tools uh, in, in some of the upper layer or other middlewares I talked about. Um, uh, perf test is pretty common for like a, a a basic benchmark. There's some things like called IB RDMA BW that also are often used as, as sort of basic speed of light benchmarks, and they they just aim to to open a single RCQ pair like Roland showed, and and stuff it with data as fast as you can. So they measure single CPU, single stream peak bandwidth, um, which which generally measures your network capability because um, when you're using these APIs, you you don't really need to do complicated multi-stream, multi-CPU stuff um, to, to just soak the, the memory bus. 
Okay, thank you. If you're, uh, so I, I wanted to actually add a clarification. It's not driver performance, right? I mean, the whole point here is you're doing zero copy. So there is very little in the hot path that you should be measuring unless it's very small messages and then it's just queuing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, eventually you reach a point where your message size is so large, you know, I'm sending yeah. gigabyte messages. I'm, I don't care about, you know, CPU overhead, but there are other benchmarks that are, are tuned to small message performance to measure the software stack costs of sending messages into this receive queues and, and the, the, the send queues and processing the completion queues. Like you can run test PMD and, and DPDK center benchmarks. You can run your, your MPI and your MPI benchmarks, which will run, you know, very detailed performance studies that, that include like software stack overheads. Um, it, it really depends what is the, you know, what is the application you're working on for what is the correct kind of benchmark. Okay, any uh, closing questions? All right, uh, don't see any, so we'll call that a day. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the audience. All right, appreciate the attention. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.